Good morning. In normal times, during the prelude, I, I tend to look around the congregation and make eye contact with different people, just share greetings. Uh, there's Jim Moles over there, and John and Eleanor Cleveland over there, and all of the Shaws back there, and then you've got the, the renegades back there sitting back, back behind the organ, and all the rest of it. And I was just thinking, I don't know what to do with myself during the prelude in these times. But we're making it work, and here we are, and we will continue to do so. Uh, the committees and commissions will meet this week, most of them, not all. You might want to check with your uh, chair to see whether your group is, is slated to meet. One that will meet for sure is worship commission. And the reason I mention that now is that people are asking me, quite understandably, how are we going to handle Christmas Eve worship? Well, I think I know the answer. I think we all sort of think we know the answer, but it won't be official until Tuesday evening when the Worship Commission takes up that question. We'll let everybody know all that, all that we know as we come to know it. The church office will be closed tomorrow, Monday the 14th, as neither Cheryl Moles nor I can be there. And we just decided to let it be closed and, and not look for a volunteer to answer the phone uh, because typically Mondays are pretty slow anyway. Otherwise, Tuesday through Friday, we will have the office covered for anybody to come by or to call. The, as again, I said, the committees and commissions will meet Tuesday night. The Strategic Planning Task Force has completed its work and submitted its report to the session. The session has, in a very, very small way, uh, adjusted one of its recommendations. Uh, and, and over the next five weeks, we will be getting out to the church in the e-news the five different areas of focus that the Strategic Planning Task Force recommends that the whole church focus on over the next five years. So be watching for that, and, and please read those summaries as, as they become available. Youth Group High Point meets tonight, Sunday, virtually at 7.30 p.m. For our prayer concerns this morning, we're asked to pray for Sally Moulton, who is one of our older members and lives in her own a condominium at Westminster Village. She is, however, now in rehab and recovering from the virus. Um, she's doing okay as of 48 hours ago when I spoke with her last. We're being asked to pray for, uh, with, with sympathy for the families of the Scanlans and, and the Mangs and the loss of the matriarch of that clan, Ruth Sims, that's Sharon's mother. And also, let's continue to hold up the Cook family in our prayers and the quick and difficult loss of both Bill and Joyce. Sarah Kelsheimer has been communicating with me this morning, and she's not feeling too well just now, but it's not related to her rehab, but she's asking for prayers because she's, you know, a little tired, a little discouraged, and is, is so grateful that we as, a, as a, a congregation are a part of her family as well. So she's reaching out to us, and I know that we'll pray for her. Um, let's pray for Megan Rader and the whole Rader DePaolo family as she continues to go through a series of perplexing and very difficult uh, medical issues. And finally, thanks be to God for those who have recovered and are recovering. I became aware this morning of yet another member of our church uh, whose infection with the virus I had no idea about, but the message I got from this person was, I'm two days away from finishing my quarantine and I feel great. So that caused me to say, let's do thank God for those moments where we receive encouragement, whether it's in the disease area or in any other area of our lives. And in order to encourage ourselves, let us now join in the power of the Spirit to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. <clears throat> our opening prayer Excuse me. Eternal Creator, with you each moment of life is full of wonder and surprise. We pray you to make us watchful as we await the coming of Christ. Grant that we may not be found sleeping in sin, but awake and rejoicing in your newness of life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
We light this candle as a symbol of joy. May the joyful promise of your presence, O God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. The prophet Zechariah called upon his people to sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear evil no more. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. God calls us to confession and forgiveness. How can we stand in the presence of God? Let us confess those ways in which we must grow to prepare for Christ to come into our lives. O holy God, our very waiting in Advent is a confession. If we are waiting for Emmanuel, we are not yet with you. If we are waiting for Jesus, we need a savior. If we are waiting for the Messiah, the proud are still powerful, the mighty are still exalted, the hungry stand unheard at the door. We confess that we have not known you in our sister, have not loved you in our brother, have not served you in our neighbor. Hear our confession, we pray, and heal us through your presence in our lives. Amen. Our declaration of forgiveness tells us to hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace.
Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, kids. How are you today? Welcome to this third Sunday in Advent. Now, you may not realize, but we have one more Sunday in Advent, the fourth Sunday, and that's the Sunday when we light the fourth candle, which represents the birth of Jesus. I don't know, something about Christmas that just makes me so joyful. I know it does you too. It's, it's really a very special time for Christians. So much light in the world. Even though we don't often see so much happiness, we know the light of God is in the world with us. And that truly makes us happy. But before we can talk about the baby Jesus on the fourth Sunday of Advent, Today we're going to talk about the third Sunday of Advent, and we're going to talk about a pretty famous person in the Bible. I think he's a pretty famous person, and I kind of like this guy. He was called John the Baptist. Hmm, John the Baptist. He was a prophet. He was a witness. And the Bible tells us that he bore witness to the light. And think about that. Huh. Do you know who the light or what the light is? You got your answer? He bore witness to the light, which was Jesus. He went about preaching that Jesus was coming, that he was among us, that he was the light that was going to come into the world. He created a path. For Jesus so that people knew that Jesus was coming. But John was also a very smart man and so he was very careful to tell the people that he was preaching to about the light that he himself, mm -mm, he wasn't the light, it was Jesus that was the light. Now sometimes when you read a story and you don't have a picture of the characters, you kind of draw your own imagination about them. Well, my imagination about John is that he was a rather large man, and he had a very kind face. He had a very bellicose voice that would go out among all the people in very open places. And he had very long arms. I don't know why I think that, but I think his arms were a representation of how he drew people into him so he could go out on that path and he could tell people about the light because John had the light in him. John knew how to reflect that light out into the world. Now we're going to try a little experiment so I can explain to you what that means and Pastor Mike's going to help me here, so we'll see how this goes. We're going to keep our six feet distance, too, because I don't have my mask on. So I have a flashlight. Now, if I take this flashlight and I just place it on the floor, it kind of what? Well, maybe it lights my path. Yeah. You know, um, have you ever been walking in the woods and you needed a little extra light as the sun went down or maybe as the sun was coming up and you had a flashlight? You got through the woods just fine. Or maybe you woke up in the middle of the night and there was no light in your house and you had to grab a flashlight so you could see clearer. Well, flashlight's a very important thing. But now we're gonna use this flashlight to do a little experiment. So if I take this flashlight and I shine it into this mirror, 
What do you think, young people? What's going to happen? Got your answer? Let's see. All right. Here we go. Now, watch. I'm going to, the flashlight's going to hit the mirror and see what it happens to me. What's happening? Kapow! Did you see a light come on me? We're going to try that one more time. What I want you to watch for is when I ref push this flashlight into this mirror, it's going to reflect light back on me. You ready? Wow. Wow. Was that your answer? Thank you, Pastor Mike. Was that your answer? That when I shone that light on that mirror, that it was going to come back to me? I know it was, because you're really smart young people. But you know what now? I'm thinking that maybe we should all start thinking that we're a mirror. And Jesus is our light. And he comes to us, and he brings that light inside of us. And it reflects out into the world. You're part of the world. Your home, your school, your church, your dance studio, your sports arena, your playground. You are the reflection of God's light. But the only way that God can get his light into you is for you to be receptive to that light, just like John the Baptist was. And I know you will be, because this Christmas season, especially, we all need to be reflective of the light of Jesus that I know is in each and every one of you young people. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your saving grace. Thank you for this Christmas season and all seasons that we can share the reflective light of Jesus Christ to our special part of the world. And all God's children said, Amen. Our scripture today comes from John 1, 6 through 8, and 19 to 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all men might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the path and the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees and they asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah or Elijah nor a prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know and one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. This took place in Bethany 
across the Jordan where John was baptizing. I'm sure many of you will, will know or recall that our, our live streamer is Scott Rakup. Scott, I'm thinking it never gets tired for you listening to Shinwan sing like that. Thank you so much, both of you. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes to us as Psalm 126 in its entirety. Listen now for the word of God. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seeds for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Pentagon has twice as many bathrooms as it needs. 
Do you know why? This is true. I'll give you a hint. It was built in the 1940s. No. In those days, many states still had laws that segregated the bathrooms, that prevented African Americans from using the same facilities as Caucasians. Hence, double bathrooms. I might add that the African American bathrooms, while equal in number, are about half as large in terms of total square feet. This was not so long ago. In high school, an acquaintance of mine got arrested for taking bets on sports. Today, not so many years later, in the words of author Leonard Sweet, I quote, Today, the biggest bookie you know is whatever state you inhabit." End quote. In 1970, Alvin Toffler wrote a cultural critique called Future Shock. His thesis was that not only was change the defining characteristic of the modern era, but the pace of change would accelerate relentlessly. And boy, does it feel like he's right. For example, in 1967, the denominations that now comprise the Presbyterian Church USA to which we belong, those denominations together boasted 6.5 million members in the United States. Today, our church has only about 2.5 million members, a decline of 62%. What changed? What happened? Well, we hear a, a, a commonly hear a, a, a list of, of guesses as to why we've lost so much size. Some people believe that our denomination's emphasis on social justice issues has alienated people who have left us, our former brothers and sisters. Others point to the success of the big box churches with their rock concert worship, the high tech, high action worship experiences, claiming that younger people today barely have attention points, much less attention spans. There's some truth to that, but that, what that means is that their brains have been rewired in such a way that they demand lights, camera, action. Our traditional staid worship stands not a chance, we hear. Well, another reason people will give for the decline of our denomination is the secularization of our culture in this postmodern age. With the decrease of spirituality in the population, goes this argument, there are fewer church members to go around. As I see it, each one of these explanations has a piece of the truth but none of them gets to the real root of the problem. I believe the Presbyterian and other mainline, or sometimes now called old line, and that hurts, old line churches, I believe we've declined primarily because we have just about given up on witnessing to the gospel. We do not speak about Jesus. We do not speak about the redemption we have in him. We do not speak of his call to serve the poor and the broken. We do not speak of the hope we have. The hope for this life and the hope for the life to come. We see dozens of shares and likes on Facebook for restaurants, puppy videos, gyms where friends work out, hairstylists, streamed programs that we need to watch on our smart TVs, some smart Alex insult of somebody with whom we disagree, state parks, Aunt Tilly's cornbread recipe. When was the last time you shared or liked your church? When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. 
Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. So open Psalm 126. Now, scholars cheerfully admit that they have no idea who wrote this thing or when. They don't even know why. It begins with when the Lord restored the fortunes, but it's written in such a vague, ambiguous manner that there's no way of telling. There's no detail offered up, no historical reference whatsoever to know which time it was in the Old Testament that the Lord had restored the fortunes and moved this psalmist to write this poem. But that's actually handy for us. It makes it easier for us to appropriate Psalm 126 to our time and place. When the Lord restores our fortunes, we ought to fill our mouths with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. We ought to bear witness to what we see God doing around us, over us, through us. I had a friend, Mark, who pastored in Assemblies of God Church. He could say the word glory in six syllables. Galaouri. He thanked Jesus for everything. I swear he praised God when he found a good parking spot. We got close enough, we became friends, that we would entrust each other. Uh, our pulpits to each other, do an exchange every once in a while. Our congregations really enjoyed our different preaching styles, or at least they said they did. I had known Mark for some years when he kind of hesitantly one day asked me, look, Mike, I know you believe in Jesus. How come I've never heard you say you do? I think that might be the first time in my life I became aware that I do not often speak about my faith. Or I may say I hope honestly that I did not speak much about my faith, but after that experience, I began to do so more often. But here's why. As I have stated before, I grew up a Presbyterian. I am as steeped in the tea of the Reformed tradition as any man or woman. Part of that Presbyterian brew is a reluctance to speak about our faith. As I grew up in this church, in dozens of ways, I was given to understand that we simply do not get too enthusiastic about Jesus. It's just not done. Now, my parents were not arrogant people. I think almost all of the people in the churches we attended when I was growing up would, would hate to think that they were at all snobbish, even a little bit, or that they somehow viewed themselves as above other people. And yet, somehow, the style, the texture, the ethos of our corporate expression of worship and ministry came rarely to contain a clear witness to Jesus. We just did not speak of him. I submit that that holds true for us here today at Central Presbyterian Church in Terre Haute. Now, please, understand, I am not accusing us of a lack of faith. To the contrary, I've made no bones at all about my love for this church. I love being here. This is a great church. I'm happy that God has put me here. I sometimes ask myself, how did I end up here? But what I am saying is that we're just too darn Presbyterian sometimes. We just don't bear witness to our Savior with as much enthusiasm and joy as he merits. And a culture thirsty to hear about hope and healing surrounds us. We have the message they long to hear. How might we witness to it? 
we turn to John, the Gospel of John, that is, and John the Baptist. We call the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, the look-alike Gospels, because they tend to look alike, synoptic. Syn in Greek means alike, and optic means visual, or of the vision. If the other three are the synoptics, we might call John the anoptic, does not look alike, or the monoptic, looks unique, gospel. John tells different parts of the Jesus story than the other three. John gives us much more of the inner dialogue, the inner monologue of Jesus, his thoughts and his prayers. John dives more deeply into the mystical elements of his life, of his work, of his preaching. This gospel, John, opens with poetic words of praise for the unfathomable nature of Christ. He is light and life. He has always existed. He defeats evil. But, as enthusiastic as John the gospel writer is about Jesus, he stops right in the middle of this poem of praise to Jesus, and he'll pick it up again a little bit later, but right here in the middle, he drops this reference to John the Baptist as though he is such an important figure that John the Gospel writer can't wait even another couple of verses to talk about him. Who was John the Baptist? That was brilliant, by the way. That, I promise you, Sheree and I did not coordinate this morning, and yet her children's sermon was right on topic and, and hit some of the points I'm going to hit, but don't worry, I'll, I'll hit him again. Anyway. Who was this John the Baptist? Well, he was Jesus' second cousin. Half second cousin, I guess you might say, because his mother Mary was first cousins to John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth. The other Gospels tell us that John the Baptist grew up to become a charismatic figure who drew attention to himself by dressing strangely, by preaching pointed criticisms of the Jewish religious authorities, and by baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins. But John the Gospel writer also tells us who John the Baptist said he was not. He said he was not the Messiah, not Elijah, and not the prophet. These three denials actually tell us a great deal about Israel in Jesus' day. The prophets of old had long predicted the appearance of the Messiah, and had given all these sort of enigmatic, cloaked, poetical sort of hints as to how and when it might happen. And the Jews of the first century, Jesus' day, were looking for the Messiah any minute. Their reading of their scripture was starting to add up. It was beginning to, to coalesce in the idea that he might be showing up any second now. Many of the Old Testament prophets had given them uh, little pieces of information that they were seeing come true right before their very eyes. Malachi had promised that Elijah would come back to earth before the Messiah appeared. And a whole lot of people were looking at John the Baptist and thinking, well, is that Elijah? Their scholars, the Jewish scholars, had developed the idea of an unnamed prophet who would also appear and presage this arrival. People were looking at John the Baptist, others of them, and saying, maybe he's the prophet Though John the Baptist denied it, the gospel writers saw him as the God-sent messenger who bore witness to the immediate appearance of the Savior. That's who John the Baptist was. John the gospel writer tells us that John the Baptist came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. John's primary purpose was using his own notoriety to draw attention to Jesus so that all people might have faith in him as the Messiah. Do we have that faith? If yes, can we speak about it? Can we bear witness? John came to bear witness. We are called to bear witness. How might even we Presbyterians do that? 
We need not learn how to pronounce the word glory in six syllables. We need not worship as though Bono of U2, the rock band, had suddenly stopped a song at a concert to share five ways to witness to Jesus to your friends. You know, the big box strategy. Get them to come in with the coffee shop and the rock band and then tell them about Jesus. No, in fact, Bono of U2 can actually give us some clues about how we might witness to our faith in our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. From I still haven't found what I'm looking for, to the first time, to 40, and other songs as well. Bono has written and performed a number of songs with Christian themes. Go read the lyrics. Look them up online. It's not that hard to see. Now, to his credit, Bono has never claimed to be an exemplary follower of Jesus. On the contrary, he has always preferred to leave it kind of unsure with people. People ask him this to this day all the time, and he just kind of lets them say what they want to say. He would rather busy himself doing the actual work. He legitimately has given an awful lot of his, his time, energy, and money to things like bringing uh, reliable water sources to third world villages. And Bono has spent an awful lot of time, energy, and money lobbying politicians for just policies. In fact, because of that very thing, of, of getting in politicians' grills about doing Jesus things with their power, Bono, as a result of that, has developed a real friendship with George W. Bush. Two Jesus followers we might think had nothing in common and might not even like each other really do because of their common witness to Jesus. If we Presbyterians cannot quite follow John the Baptist's example of showy, confrontive witness for Jesus as the Christ, perhaps we can do real witnessing in quieter and yet equally potent ways. First, we can strive to do our best to live as Jesus taught because we cannot gain a real hearing from other people if we are not walking our talk. Nothing in a noisy time speaks louder than action. And so we strive to do, as Bono and many others have done, including a whole lot of folks in this congregation, to volunteer of our time, energy, and money to give to the broken, to the lost, to the least. We do it not so that we will be noticed, but because Christ commands us to make his compassion real for these folks. And as we do it, we also, by the by, earn the right to be heard. And so second, we can go out there and having earned that right, speak, share our witness. There are people whom we know who would listen. Perhaps we need to know them well. Perhaps they need to see us in action a little while before they can hear us, but the time will come. And I pray myself frequently that God would keep my eyes open to that chance, that opportunity to speak. Sometimes I actually hear it. You could say something to somebody like this. I believe in Jesus. I did nothing to make it happen. It's a gift. And I'm really glad I've received it. My faith makes it possible to, for me to make sense of things even in terrible times. Times like when people I love die from a disease that they did nothing to deserve getting. Now this really does work for me. I'm still talking to somebody, witnessing. 
this really does work for me. It, it, if you don't understand it, or if you wonder whether I really mean it, maybe you could join me the next time we build a ramp for a disabled person. Or when we pin mittens and socks on our giving tree for street people. I believe this would help you even as we help others. Witness to Jesus. Speak of his love and his calls for justice and compassion in word and deed. Someday, God willing, soon, we will reopen our church. And when that blessed day arrives, maybe, just maybe, you could even gasp, invite somebody here to worship with us. Witness to Jesus. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we pray first that we might indeed receive and nurture the gift of faith that comes from your spirit. And we ask, Lord, that it would give us courage to speak in word and deed of that very faith. Help us to bear witness, we ask, in your Holy Son's name. Amen. I mentioned the year 1967 in my opening illustration intentionally. And I went back and looked up the membership in 1967 because I knew that we were going to be reading as a re uh, response to the sermon. We were going to be reading from the Confession of 1967, which was written in 66 and 67 by a committee of Presbyterians. Now, committees of Presbyterians do not always produce lyrical, moving prose, to say the least. But the Confession of 1967, when adjusted for modern language use, remains a wonderful document. And so if you have your bulletins up on screen at home, you can read along with me as I read a short snippet from the Confession of 1967. The new life in Christ does not release humanity from conflict with unbelief, pride, lust, fear. We still must struggle with disheartening difficulties and problems. Nevertheless, as we mature in love and faithfulness in our life with Christ, we live in freedom and good cheer, bearing witness on good days and evil days, confident that the new life is pleasing to God and helpful to others. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, this day is young and yet already I have been engaged in four separate conversations with people talking about the presidential election. We pray therefore first in our prayers of intercession, our prayers asking you to intercede in the lives of others. We pray, Lord, that there be a peaceful and complete transfer of power in our nation. We pray that there might somehow be reconciliation between the factions. We pray for patience. We pray for understanding across the divides. We pray, Lord, that as followers of Christ, we, in our own small ways, might diffuse anger might hear the concerns of others and take them seriously, and might be given the ability to discern fact from fiction. O oh Lord our God, we pray for all people whom you have appointed to positions of leadership from the President of the United States right down to the guy who escorts the children across the street on their way to school. We ask, Lord, that you would keep all safe spiritually and emotionally, 
and that they would be able to remain convicted and committed to the principles which ought to be guiding their decision making. With humility, understanding that we are imperfect as well, we nevertheless ask that we as a society and as a church, in our families, in our places of business, might be able to hold one another accountable in love for the truths and the teachings that you have given us. We pray, Lord, for the sick. We rejoice with those who rejoice and grieve with those who grieve. We ask, Lord, that you would give those who are hurting healing. That as the days pass, they might walk with you and find even that possibility of joy in memory. For those who are currently sick, we ask, Lord, that the fear that they feel might be eased and that it would be your will that they might return fully to their lives. Lord, we all know by this time someone who has or has had the COVID virus. In the silence of these next few moments, we ask that you would hear us as we give back to you those names and express our concern and love for them. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we also all know people who are at odds, in conflict, sometimes in relationships that have been long and healthy, and that the times in which we live have exacerbated these divisions. Lord, in the silence of these few minutes now, please hear us as we name those people we know who are suffering in this way. Lord, hear our prayers. And finally, Lord, each one of us also knows people, plural, whose faith in you has waned or even disappeared. We ourselves sometimes struggle in this way. And so, Lord, in the silence of these next few moments, we ask that you would hear us as we name the names of those we know whose faith is at risk. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so bold as to come to you in this prayer, asking of you that you would minister to us and to others, primarily because you have commanded us to pray. And you have asked us to pray in various ways, including intercessory prayer. But Lord, we come to you also now, praying to you in the words which you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Truly, it is written that there are a variety of gifts, but it is the same Lord who receives them. And there are a variety of ways that we can give of our gifts. You've seen some of them exercised this morning in this worship service. We thank the whole church for the giving you continue to do in every way and remind you that it is still very easy and possible for you to give financially to the church. Thank you again for what you have continued to do in all ways. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.